Hi, this is Allison Sheridan of the DocillaCast podcast, hosted at podfeed.com, a technology week podcast with an ever so slight Apple bias. Today is Sunday, January 1st, 2023, and this is show number 921. Well, Happy New Year! And as you can tell, I have my annual laryngitis. But don't worry, you are not going to have to listen to this voice for 40 minutes. Last week, I happened to accidentally record all of the remaining I'm Still Using It segments, only to realize the show was far too long. So I was able to take four of those segments and I moved them into this week. Also, Joe from the Northwoods helped me figure out how to extract those segments from Hindenburg so that we could have them played this week. Graham Shepard is back with a recording about his photo workflow, and trust me, his voice is way better than mine. But that still left me reading about 15 minutes with this voice. When Jill from the North Woods heard from me that my voice was gone yet again, she stepped up and pulled forward to this week a recording she'd planned about her new Schlage Smart Lock. It takes a village to get this show off the ground, and the Nocella Castaways are the best village around. Well, let's start off by hearing from the Nocilla Castaways, the last installment of the I'm Still Using It series. Michael Westbay is up next. I'm still using Ingress. Playing Ingress? Anyway, hi there, Nocilla Castaways. Michael from Yokohama here. It all started around the end of 2013. I was thinking about what my goals would be for 2014 and was really thinking that I needed to commute. I'd been working from home since around 2004, and it was becoming clear that I would only leave the house to open and close the shutters in the morning and evening. A commute in the morning and evening seemed like a good way to begin and end each day. And if I could lose some of that tire around my waist, so much the better. Meanwhile, I was very jealous of all the techies playing Ingress that I heard on the various Twitch shows. But it wasn't available for my iPhone 4S, and I didn't know anyone from whom to get an invite. So I started plotting out what my commute might look like. Hmm, well, I did have a Nexus 7 that I mainly used for reading. I also had a portable Wi-Fi hotspot for when I took my MacBook out to the park to work. Ingress was then released out of beta shortly before Christmas. So I signed up and quickly looked at this scanner, which showed that most of the area I lived in was green. That's the Enlightened. So I went with the blue faction, the Resistance, to have a good challenge. The whole idea of a commute became moot. I would go out after lunch exploring all kinds of places. Shrines, temples, a statue here, a monumental plaque there. Where a green-controlled portal was, I went to either attack or gather items to level up. In the first year, I lost 20 kilograms just running around the 5-kilometer radius from home, capturing portals and creating fields. I went from huffing and puffing to get up the hill behind Shomyoji, a nearby temple, to being able to climb the more direct stairway with hardly a pause. And I ran into a lot of people also playing the game, especially around Shomyoji. They all had similar stories of weight loss and a general feeling of overall better health. I've tried the other Niantic games, Pokemon Go, Harry Potter, Pikmin, but I never stopped playing Ingress alongside them. That's really fun, Michael. You know, the only time I'd ever heard of Ingress was when Pokemon was introduced and all of the Ingress kids were all, we were there before it was cool, you know. (laughs) Anyway, it sounds like you're having a whole lot of fun with it, Michael, and I'm glad Ingress is still there for you. Stephen from New Zealand is up next with a quick little entry to I'm Still Using It. He wrote, I'm still using my 13-inch MacBook Pro from early 2013. I love that it has MagSafe and an SD card slot. It has a massive 8 gigabytes of RAM paired with a 250 gigabyte SSD, and there's still 72 gigabytes unused. It has had one battery replacement and it still goes well, although it can't be upgraded beyond Catalina. He signed off, in Maori, the language of the indigenous people of New Zealand, and I'm going to try to pronounce it myself, Na Mihi. Well, I think it's amazing that you're still using a Mac that's nearly a decade old. I would like to know how many people can still say that about their Windows machines, right? Continuing from down under, Rose from Tasmania sent in her, I'm still using it. By the way, Rose is the one who coined the term Nocilla Castaway in the first place. She wrote, 
I am still using TypeStyler by Strider Software from TypeStyler.com. I've been using it for about five years now, maybe even longer. 2009 is the year TypeStyler returned after the major macOS rebuild, so I may have been using it for 10 years. I use about 10% of the functions of this app, but I will still use it as long as Strider software keeps updating. In fact, I'd go so far as to say I won't update my OS until TypeStyler is updated. Now that I've retired from paid employment, I volunteer with several community groups. As I love graphic design, I design placards, badges, what you call buttons, leaflets, event posters, and such. TypeStyler offers an amazing, if somewhat bewildering, array of options for each aspect of your project. Starting a new project, you are offered eight templates, page, poster, banner, CD, bag, box, 3D model, and video. And I've barely scraped the surface, as they say. TypeStyler is macOS only for $59.99, and a 30-day fully functional free trial is available. Well, thanks for this, Rose. While TypeStyler's interface certainly harkens back to an earlier day in UI design, there's something comforting about a user interface that isn't always moving around on you and changing all the time so you can't find what you need. Thanks for sending this in, Rose. To finish up our I'm Still Using It series, I've saved Tom Merritt for last, who delivers his story in his own unique way. O K120, a poem by Tom Merritt. O Logitech K120 keyboard, dome over membrane star of my typing, my spelling is not your fault, for you always respond to my wishes, not others. Blame autocorrect, not you. O K120 of 2012 release, where did I get two of you? No matter. You are both stalwart, taking years of pounding without complaint, your resistance to crumbs impeccable, your bright white letters indelible. OK120 companion of my fingers, take down this ode to you so that others may know your greatness has no bounds except those imposed by Anzai or ISO. No ergonomic break for me, no clack clicks nor silent presses. You make the noise I need to know that you will always be there. O oh, Logitech K120, 10 years of service, more to come, with typing soft or loud as a drum on my desk, you yet sit, proud to say of you, I'm still using it. Well, I think that was a very fitting to the end of I'm still using it. I'm not saying you can't send in more if you don't want to, or if you want to, I should say, but oh my gosh, Tom, that was absolutely epic. Well, I am super happy to announce Chris Stearns as our newest patron of the PodFeed podcast. Chris took his hard-earned dollars and he went to podfeed.com slash Patreon and signed up to contribute a monthly amount that showed the value he gets from the work we do here. Listener John also sent in a donation and he did it in a different way. He did it by going to podfeed.com slash PayPal and did a one-time donation. To be honest though, he does this from time to time, so it's not exactly a one-time thing. My favorite part is how he writes nice things to me when he donates. Thank you so much to Chris and John for their continued support of the PodFeed podcast. A few months back, I reviewed Photo Reviewer, a superb app for triaging photos, and teased that I might just talk about where it fits in my workflow in more depth. So right now I'm going to try to explain my workflow clearly with some extra detail on the raw processing with DxO software. To be clear, I'm going to talk about how I deal with photos from actual photo shoots taken in RAW on my Micro Four Thirds camera. For me, this is normally bird photography, but it certainly is not my everyday photos that are on my iPhone. The problem I'm solving here is wanting a workflow that optimizes six things. Import RAW photos. Triage many photos with the ability to zoom in and compare sharpness. Process the raw photos with great image quality, particularly regarding noise. Help me cope with the huge numbers of files and their archived backups. Edit the photos in a non-destructive manner. And enjoy the photos where I want them with my wife. And it needs to be fi financially sustainable as I head towards retirement. For me, that means no subscription model pricing but that's personal to me. Step one is to get the photos onto my computer. 
For this, I can just open Photo Reviewer and use its import dialog and get going. The images are copied to the correct folder and I can move on to step two, which is the actual triage I described before. This triage puts all my photos into either the vetoed or the approved subfolders. Now I want to get onto the processing, the approved photos, which is step three. I finished with Photo Reviewer, so Command Q quits the app, and with that, it triggers Keyboard Maestro, which starts another script. The script first checks to see how many approved photos there are in the approved folder, then asks if I want to process them. I click Yes, and the script opens the approved photos in DxO Pure Raw 2, my raw developer of choice. DxO make two interesting products, Photolab, now at version 6, and Pure Raw at version 2. I have a particular problem with my photography in that I like taking photos of birds and I like walking in the jungle, which means very little light. I also said I like walking, so I have an amazing little micro four thirds camera with a 300mm lens on it and a 1.4x extension on it. This gives an incredible 840mm equivalent focal length that I can use handheld all day, albeit limited to a max of f5.6 and therefore high ISOs. I want to squeeze out the most from this setup and I'm constantly looking at new cameras to see what their ISO is looking like now. I'm sorely tempted, but then I think again about what the software can do for me. I found that for much less money than a new camera, the magical algorithms from DxO can remove noise so effectively from my raw images that I have easily gained a whole stop from the best I'd managed before, and I'm only using the auto settings. Not only can DxO remove noise exceptionally well, but it does so without losing detail or color definition from the image, at least to my level of caring. What I get from this, this is, like I said, a whole extra stop, which I spend by pushing my default ISO on my Olympus OMD EM1 to 3200. That's pretty high for this camera, and I shoot with it all the time, every single photo, even in daylight. The images have beautiful color, smooth bokeh, and great detail. So, there are two flavors offered by DxO. Photolab is a library software and I used it for a while for the trial period, trying to like it, but I just found it too prone to error with tags and other things. Maybe it's just my propensity to tinker with things, but I found my changes were getting mixed up and I just felt like I was fighting the software. So I abandoned that and now I use Apple Photos as my library by adding all my bird photos there once they have been fully ed edited. But that's still to come. Instead, I use DxO Pure Raw 2, which has none of the library features, but is instead simply a processor for raw images. I haven't played around with everything it can do, I just use the basics. When you install the software, it installs the standalone app and asks if you want Finder integration. I found I didn't ever really want to initiate things from the Finder with no interface, so I didn't choose that option. All I do is open the raw files in Pure Raw 2, click Process Photos, and then click Process, making sure the right options are still selected. These options are to use the slower Deep Prime for noise removal, do the optical corrections, and save as a DNG file in a subfolder. It takes about six seconds per photo on my M1 Air, but even with 100 photos, that's barely enough time to get myself a cup of tea and it only needs to be done once. So my photos are processed now, and I have folders and subfolders with photos in them, so I need some file management going on. Step four is file management. Let's recap. From triage, I had raw photos in an approved folder and raw photos in a vetoed folder. Processing did not change this, but created a DxO folder in the approved folder with DNG versions in there. When I quit DxO Pure Raw 2, another keyboard maestro script is triggered 
and this one does my filing for the approved photos. In another part of my computer, I have a folder named Photography and a separate folder called Archive. The keyboard maestro script renames and moves the approved DNG photos, the ones I have processed in Pure Raw, to the Photography folder and the original approved raw photos to the Archive folder, possibly to never be seen again. Next up comes Hazel, which is watching three folders for me. It watches the photography and the archive folders and moves anything that appears into a subfolder. Have these quite shallow, so inside are folders with year hyphen month as names. So 2022 hyphen 11 and 2022 hyphen 12, for example. This gives me enough of a file system to find things and should be pretty future proof. Hazel also watches the vetoed folder, which has all the photos that I really don't want to keep. When they get a week old, Hazel clears them out for good, which gives me enough time to correct any mistakes I made. Step five is editing the photos. As I have little time, this is usually just cropping and color editing, perhaps. Like I said, most of my photos are of birds and so it is usually not possible to set up the framing exactly right in camera, so I usually crop in some more. This could be done anywhere, but I really like the Affinity apps and so I'm doing it in Affinity Photo 2. The photos I kept are not all good, they are just what I chose to keep, so I'll open the ones I actually like, do some editing, then save the Affinity file back into the same folder as the DNG and export a JPEG to another folder called Exports. There's no folder structure in there, just a flat collection of photos. These are my pride and joy, the photos I want on my lock screen, in my Photos widget, and on my desktop. So, they get imported into the Photos app. But I have a problem, and a solution I'm not sure will scale well. So, if you have any bright ideas, please let me know. Step six. Importing into the Photos app is simple. I can just drag the image in or use the share sheet or other methods, I'm sure. The problem is that sometimes I re-edit an image and importing it will leave me with two copies, which is not great. The solution I have implemented uses Keyboard Maestro again. The script looks at all the photos in my exports folder then searches through my photos library for images with the same file name. When it finds one, it adds the photo to an album called To Delete. Once done, the script adds all the photos to the Photos app and opens the To, Do, the to Delete album for me and selects all the images. I can then look to see if there's anything wrong and if not, I'll manually delete all the photos in that album. It works, but it's clunky as anything, and I really want a better solution. But in the end, I have solved my workflow problems. A photo reviewer imports my photos and lets me triage them. DxO Pure Raw 2 processes the raw photos with, I think, the best denoising software available. Keyboard Maestro and Hazel move the photos around and file them neatly for me with useful file names. Affinity Photo 2 lets me do my final editing. Apple Photos lets me see the photos and exposes them for me in a delightful manner. This workflow may not suit everyone, but I think the steps are important for anyone who does project type photography to consider. Keyboard Maestro is perhaps a bit clunky for what I'm doing here and Affinity Photo 2 has plenty of competition. But I really want to emphasize that I believe Photo Reviewer, DxO Pure Raw 2, Hazel and Apple Photos are arguably the best software anyone could use for the functions they serve here. And I highly recommend that anyone into raw photography gives them a look. That was terrific, Graham. I really like the, the flow that you do in explaining each of the steps with it. Um, you know, I've heard a lot of great things about DxO from Alistair Jenks and from Stephen Getz. 
I just wish I took more raw photos that were uh, compatible with it. I don't think they support raw photos from the iPhone yet, but when they do, I think maybe that could start to be uh, start to be a lot of fun. But I love how you use all these different tools, especially Hazel, to manage your workflow. And thank you so much for having your voice in this recording instead of mine. Hello, this is Jill from the North Woods. I've been interested in home automation for a really long time. When I was a kid, my dad and I used to talk about it all the time. He was very interested in setting up the X10 old school home automation, but he knew it would cost a lot of money in the 70s. But now automation is so low cost, easy to do, and powerful. So it revived my whole interest in it. I have some good automations going. I have the Hue system for lights and picked up Hue motion sensors, which are fantastic. They make the whole house more like Star Trek and easier to use than ever. In addition, I have Maras plugs, a garage opener, ring doorbells and cameras, and Amazon voice devices. Echo B controls my thermostats, along with some sensors. I even set up my bird so that he had automatic music with different genres at different times, on Sono speakers, and automatic lights that simulate natural daylight. He has temperature sensors, so if the house gets too cold or too warm, it'll heat him up to keep him healthy. He also has his own ring camera. I have some morning routines, bedtime routines. I also do automations that make my house look like there's always people in it. Not only that, I've also tried automations. If my house got too warm, a series of fans would automatically come on and try to cool the house down. Mostly I try to keep my bedroom cool so I can sleep at night. But also I have a Schlage lock that I ordered back in November of 2017. It's called the Schlage Z-Wave Connect Camelot. I was excited about it. It works with Amazon devices so I can order the door to be open. It also interacts with the Smart Things Hub. It allows me to use if this then that to provide myself with a button on my phone and my watch to open up the door. I love this lock. It works in cold times. It works every time. It's very secure and well-built, allowing me to pass codes to friends and pet sitters. The funny story is I had a cat sitter who I hired many times. Then I got this lock. I was at a conference and she was supposed to come to my house on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Wednesday rolled around and she still hadn't been to my house. So I texted her and asked her if she was planning on coming. She said, oh, no, no, I've been coming to your house. It's just that I haven't been able to check in via the app. I replied, well, that can't possibly be true because the new lock texts me every time the door is unlocked and the door is locked again. And the door hasn't been locked or unlocked since I left on Sunday. There was a big pause. I waited. She finally says, I'll be there in a few minutes. Before I installed the lock, I don't know how many times she actually came. I talked to the pet company, and that was that. But then other frustrations started to pile in. While I loved my lock, it didn't have an app. It didn't work with HomeKit. And to set the settings on the relock time or the alarm, it required a bunch of different pin codes that you would put in to set the time. Nothing complicated about it, but you'd have to find the manual, figure out what the pin codes were, and then make the change. Half the time you tried it, somehow you got an extra digit in there. Then the formula would error, so it was a bit frustrating. The second problem is SmartThings Hub is so limited with its ability. While I hear if you're good at programming, you can do many interesting things with it, but I just was never interested enough to try anything. So without doing that, the system was limited to only the things I could get from other apps, like If This and That. The last problem was I used If This and That to communicate between devices, so I started relying on it to set up automations with the same device. A while ago, they went to a subscription model and they said they had a forever price and I could pick whatever I wanted my subscription fee to be. I didn't do very complicated things, only used it a little, maybe 20 formulas, very simple. So I set the price to $1, but then they came back and said, we're going to set a limit of only 10 items, 10 formulas, so that if you want more, you must upgrade and pay more. That wasn't exactly what I thought I agreed to regarding a subscription fee. So I started cleaning out my formulas. 
I could get it under 10, but then it just wasn't useful enough to make it worthwhile. I switched a lot of the formulas over to using the Hue app, which is really good and comes with a lot of formulas. Moras 2, which has a solid app for automating their devices. It also seemed that services were pulling out of if this and that. For instance, Moras, for their garage doors and their small plugs, decided they were no longer going to support if this and that, and they were going to remove all functionality. It didn't really help me and my whole fan automation I had going to keep the house cool. And then the last thing is there were some weird bugs. The hall light, which is right outside my bedroom, started coming on and off at all sorts of different times. Four in the morning, five in the morning, six in the morning. It used to be that I had a outside motion trigger, but then I couldn't get it to stop. There were bug formulas that were causing it to happen ever since then. And since it was the only service that used that light, I tried to remove all the formulas. I removed the links between if this and that. Then I denied it permission and nothing seemed to fix it. Finally, when I removed the lights from the Hue system entirely and re-added them to Hue, that broke the chain. That was annoying, and at that point, I just wanted a new system. I never used HomeKit before, but since I was already invested in the Apple world, why not give it a try? Is it me, or is Apple just taking over my whole life? So then I tried to get everything into HomeKit as best I could, see what would actually just start working. Less things to deal with, less apps to deal with, and probably more secure than the SmartThings hub, or if this and that. It just seemed like less worry. And in the world of security, when you're talking about things in your home, having less is more secure. So the first step is, is what I moved over what I had. Hugh immediately took over and went to HomeKit. That was great. I had a few Moras plugs that weren't HomeKit enabled. So I bought a couple of additional ones that were HomeKit plugs to do more complicated things like that fan situation. I left the older plugs to be for more simple things like the bird light and other automations that didn't need to be detailed. Allison suggested I try the home bridge. So I set that up. I found Ring and Moras plugins. So all those devices came in too. Pretty nice. Now I have a lot of things in one place. But I also found out that I needed to have a hub in order to do more sophisticated formulas. I had an old Generation 2 iPad Pro, and I set that up to be my hub. Then one day I left the house with it not plugged in. The battery is pretty run down. All of a sudden, my automations went away when the iPad died. I thought I needed to do something more permanent. The HomePod Mini would be a perfect option for that. Also, it sounds from various articles that functionality like Matter will only be available on HomePod Minis and will not come to iPads. So there, I ordered the new HomePod Mini, and now I have a brand new hub that can do much more. The whole project is starting to come into focus. The Schlaglock was the very last piece that was an outlier to HomeKit. So I started researching locks I could buy. Many of the other locks had issues that I wasn't willing to deal with. I really wanted the Schlage lock. For one weird reason or another, Schlage locks weren't showing up at the typical nerd sites. I thought maybe they sunset the entire line. But Allison sent me an article showing me that Schlage locks with HomeKit were one of the best HomeKit locks out there. Why couldn't I find it? So I started looking around and realizing that they are a well-known lock company, not a technology company. Most of the places they sell at are Lowe's, Home Depot. The only place that had them in stock in the color I wanted was Build.com. I didn't know much about them, but it's primarily for contractors and people who are putting up houses. In checking out the features and trying to determine what was the difference between this new lock compared to the lock I already had, it turned out that the locks are almost the same. The deadbolt part was the same, and I wouldn't have to remove that from the door. The part I did have to change would be the parts that contain the battery and the keypad. To get the features I wanted, and here's the important part, it's the Schlage Encode Plus touchscreen. Plus is the thing that makes it important. The one I had was the Schlage Connect, which connects to Z-Wave. They have another lock level called Encode, which allows you to use the app they produce. And it's pretty darn good too. It's a little bit more expensive at the Connect model, 
And then the third stage, the ENCODE Plus, which makes it HomeKit enabled, is even more expensive. So while I wasn't looking to spend more money, this was the last piece to the entire puzzle. It felt worthwhile to be done with all the nickel and diming technology I had all over the place. Not knowing who these people were at Build.com. But you know what? The lock came two days later. On the third day, one of the coldest days of the year, I decided to install the lock. It took about a half hour. The instructions were good. The lock was very familiar to me compared to the one I already had, so I was impressed. The important thing to know is the Schlag and Code Plus lock, you must set it up first in the Schlag app. Once you do that, it will give you access to additional features, such as settings when it comes to the brute force alarm. If someone tries to bust down your door, it starts to holler. The automatic relock time, so you can set it so that if you unlock your door within 30 seconds, one minute, it can relock your door again. You never have to remember. It seems like a big place where people get theft from their homes. In my neck of the woods, it's because they forget to lock their doors. It also has a relock button on the outside and a locking mechanism on the inside. So I was glad to have that setting inside the app where I didn't have to figure out a coding system to get that change made. Now it's changed to a number I like. It still works with Amazon devices and my HomePod Mini, so I can use voice commands. The nice thing is they have a way inside the app to connect to HomeKit. And there it is. The last piece of my home automation HomeKit puzzle is finished. Considering that Schlage isn't a nerd brand, their app is great. Their technology is great. Everything connected right away. What will I do with my old smart lock? I plan to put that on the door between the garage and the kitchen. It has the nice pin code on it, and I don't have to use the SmartThings hub because I don't plan on opening that remotely. That will make it easier for me to get between the garage door and the kitchen pretty quickly without remembering what I did with that stupid key. And all the features are in one place. Nicely, HomeKit started suggesting automations it could do for me, such as shutting things down in my house if I'm the last person to leave the house. If I come back, Unlock the door. I don't even have to think about it. It also has a key method and a keypad. I have automations that will open the door for me, or I can do the one tap method with my phone or watch, which opens the door, which is pretty handy when you're trying to get a bunch of bags of groceries inside of your house without much fuss. So now I'm happy with my home kit, and I'm looking forward to so many more automations. The Smart Thing Hub is gone, and other integrations are no longer needed. And I rely less on Echo devices, and they've been annoying me a lot lately. So what are my next steps? First, I plan on learning a lot more about home automation and HomeKit. I spend the holiday binging on podcasts and videos on automation. I look forward to getting into the Matter Standard, which will bring all the automations together. Second, I ordered some NFC tags that I placed in various locations. My friends had some confusions about how to get my lights on and off. So I made an NFC tag for them with a bird picture on it and called it Bird Visit. So they can either say the command out loud, if they remember it, or tap their phone and it'll bring up all the lights, everything they need to check on my bird while I'm traveling. So this is a new avenue for me. I'm really excited about it. If you have any ideas for home automation, just let us all know on Allison's Slack channel. Again, this is Jill from the Northwoods, and you can find me at smallstepspod.com. Well, I love how quickly you convert to new tech, Jill. Um, Steve and I were talking in the live show here about how amazing it is that you just are just, okay, I'm going to get rid of IFTTT and I'm going to go with HomeKit. And I'm going to change these plugs out for these plugs and I'm going to put in this this lock instead of that lock and and I'm going to change, I'm going to get the HomePod Mini and change which one my, uh, my hub is. And that's crazy how fast you do that stuff. It's quite a change, but it all makes sense. By the way, for those listening, Jill mentioned Maros plugs that weren't HomeKit compatible. I want you to understand that Maros does sell HomeKit compatible plugs. We learned that from Stephen Getz. Um, but they also sell some that are not. So really pay attention. Matter should help fix this, fix this problem. But for now, pay attention when you buy because you want to make sure you get the HomeKit compatible ones. Well, as I've mentioned a few times, Steve and I are going to Antarctica on January 17th. So Bart and Alistair are doing the shows while we're gone. I really, truly need you to send in recordings before we leave to help them do the shows. They're doing us a huge favor by doing the show, so please, please, please help them out. 
You must have gotten some cool tech over the holidays, right? Do a recording of what you got and why you like it. What problem does it solve? If you can do a script for a blog post with links, that really makes a big difference and makes it great for everyone if you can do that. We will likely have zero internets while on the ship to Antarctica, so you have to send them ahead of time. They have to be to me well before January 17th to be shared with them. I'll uh, probably give their email addresses closer to the time, but for now, send them to allison at podfeet.com. I thank you in advance for your contributions. Well, I bet you're glad to hear that you're not going to have to hear this voice anymore for the rest of this week. Did you know you can email me those contributions at allison at podfeet.com? If you have questions or suggestions, you can send those on over too. You can follow me on Twitter at podfeet, and you can find me on Mastodon at podfeet at chaos.social. And if you want to join in the fun of the conversation, you could join in our Slack community like Jill told you to at podfeet.com slash Slack, where you talk to me and all of the other lovely no castaways. Remember, everything good starts with podfeet.com. You can support the show at podfeet.com slash Patreon like Chris did, or with a one-time donation like John did at podfeet.com slash PayPal. And if you want to join in the fun of the live show, hopefully next week I will have a better voice to do that. Head on over to podfeet.com slash live on Sunday nights at 5 p.m. Pacific time. Enjoy the friendly and enthusiastic Nocilla Castaways. Thanks for listening and stay subscribed.